Without further ado, let me introduce you to Mr. Ron Willey, uh, perhaps uh, one of the SVC's most distinguished instructors. Uh, I've had the personal pleasure of working with Ron as a colleague, as a customer, as a supplier, and as a mentor. Uh, Ron has forgotten more about optical coding than I would have ever aspired to know. Ron started his first business in optical coding the year I started first grade. So when we're looking at experience, depth of knowledge, breadth of experience, uh, it's literally impossible for the uh, SBC to present a more accomplished individual to share some of his wisdom. So with that, Ron, thank you very much. And uh, I'll just shut up. Thank you, Frank, for the introduction. <clears throat> Good day to everybody. Uh, for some, it's morning, some it's night. And if you're in Australia, you say good day, mate. OK, what is it that we want to do? Basically, we want to control reflection. So we might want to enhance reflection to make a mirror <clears throat> or reduce reflection with anti-reflection coatings or select certain wavelengths to make color filters, et cetera. So first of all, we'll keep things simple and think of things that have no absorption. And so if something is not reflected, it's transmitted and they all have to add up to one or 100%. If on the other hand, we have some absorption, we have to consider that and now reflection, transmission, absorption add up to 100%. But we could also have scattering and also uh, we have to consider the wavelength. So this is more inclusive of uh, all the factors involved. For now, we'll ignore scattering and absorption and just talk about reflection and transmission. For those of you that uh, are working in heat related things, you may be interested in emis emittance or emissivity, and that's just equal to the absorption or absorptance, depending on your terminology. So let's take a simple case, uh, which was described back in the 1800s uh, mathematically by Fresnel. And uh, let's imagine a normal piece of window glass, and in that we'll have uh, light coming in from uh, the left here, impinging on the surface of glass. And we'll simplify it by saying its index of refraction is 1.5. And the air or the vacuum on the side, the left side is an index one. Some of the light is transmitted, but the reflectance here is described by Fresnel's equation. Well, first, let's say the index of refraction can have two parts. It can have a real part and an imaginary part. And this imaginary part only comes into play if there's absorption. So for simplicity, let me get back to the right picture here. If it's not absorbing, then we only have to consider the n value, and these are, of course, a function of wavelength. Now, here's Fresnel's equation that says the reflectance amplitude, this little r, is found by taking the index on the first side minus the index of refraction on the second side and dividing that by the sum of the two. Now, what we see with our eye is reflected magnitude. That's this capital R here. And that's the product of the reflectance amplitude times its complex conjugate. Now, you don't have to concern yourself with the complexity of the mathematics if you're not familiar with those terms. Just think in terms of the reflected amplitude 
and the reflected magnitude. So little r and big R. So big R is what we see with our eye, what a spectrophotometer will see. So let's take this window glass case. And if we put in the index of the air and the glass, we get this. And then we put the uh, sum of the two together and we come out with a number which is minus 0.2. Now that's the reflectance amplitude, but the reflectance magnitude is going to be the square of that basically, or about 4%. So that's typically what uh, a window glass would reflect more or less. Now the soap bubble is a good example of all the various principles involved here. If I blow this soap bubble, when I first blow it, it has uh, a certain thickness, but gravity will pull the uh, fluid down toward the bottom. So we'll get a, a situation, um, whoops. We'll get a situation where the fluid's flowing down the side. So this is getting thinner and thinner at the top until the bubble bursts. And so we'll see this fringe pattern drop uh, as this gets thinner. And as that gets very thin, it'll go towards black, which is not reflecting, and it'll burst. So there's a lot to be seen just in this. Uh, so here's that soap bubble, and we'll look at what's going on at the top of the bubble here. And uh, to back that up a minute. So we've got reflection from the first surface and from the second surface. We'll call those R1 and R2. Again, that's little r reflectance amplitude. So if we look at this bubble, uh, we see the first surface reflection and light transmitted at the first surface will reflect off the back surface and back again through the front surface. So if we look at those calculations, well, first of all, this brings up the question that some of you may have when I talk about a quarter wave optical thickness, a quat. Uh, what is that? Well, when the thickness of this uh, film is a quarter wave optical thickness at a given wavelength, and then we come back to the front again, that adds another quarter wave or a total of a half wave, and that changes the phase by 180 degrees. A quarter wave would change at 90 degrees, etc. So when you hear me talking about a quarter wave or a quat, uh, that's at a specific wavelength and is talking about an optical thickness. So let's look at this. Uh, since the reflection at the backside uh, is going from a dense medium to a rarer medium, which is the reverse of what happens at the front side. The Fresnel reflection has an opposite sign. So the first surface reflection had a minus sign, the second has a plus sign, and so these cancel each other out as seen in this figure here. So R1 goes negative and R2 goes positive. We could think then of this soap bubble as being a film uh, which has been deposited on a substrate of air. And uh, so it's, it's a somewhat simple concept. So if the film goes from zero thickness to a uh, half wave, we go from a minimum reflection to a maximum reflection. Now this circle diagram is important in what we're discussing. I like to think of things in these terms. Uh, those of you in the field will also have probably seen admittance diagrams, and these are similar to those. Uh, they're just a conformal mapping of each other if you like the mathematics of it. So if I start with zero thickness film, which is represented at these coordinates of zero, zero, and here we've got a real axis and an imaginary axis. And um, so again, here is zero 
and whatever distance we go away from zero will be a certain little r and we can square that to get the big r so the reflectance is maximum out here and minimum over here and the quarter wave point of maximum reflectance in the case of the soap bubble is over here and then if i come all the way around to a half wave it's as though I never had any thickness at all because I'm back to zero. So we'll talk again about the half wave, which is acting as an absentee layer, no thickness at all. Now, if you like the mathematics of it, this is described by the equation here, which is the reflection at the first surface plus the reflection at the back surface by plus a phase relationship which will go from uh, 0 to 180 and back to uh, 360 in what we saw in the previous slide. And so these are the components here. Now, what we haven't yet touched on is the fact that there can be multiple reflections. So not only do we get this second reflection, the light reflected at the first surface going back again to the second surface is going to come back as the third reflection up here, et cetera, et cetera. And these will be getting smaller and smaller, but they do need to be considered uh, in most cases. So the, the true mathematics of that looks like this. What I showed you previously was this part divided by one, but to include the multiple internal reflections, we've got to include this term here which would be relatively small if little r was 0.2 and so we got 0.2 times 0.2 or about 0.04. So there's only a 4% a effect of this in normal window glass. But if we had something like germanium where this number is 0.6, now we've got 0.6 times 0.6 or 0.36. So it's over a third. And so this starts to have a more dramatic effect. So we need to consider it. But this is rigorous and includes the multiple internal reflections. So if you like the mathematics of it, uh, here's the phase relationship. And that's a four pi times the index of refraction times the physical thickness divided by the wavelength. So when we're talking in quats, we've got to say quats at what wavelength? Now, here's the soap bubble and its numbers when I plug, plug them in here. And that comes out to be uh, one sixth, minus one sixth. And so if I have the front and back side of the soap bubble, I get a little less than 3% uh, reflection from that. Now, let's look at a real case of the typical magnesium fluoride coating on glass. The glass substrate is a higher index and that's this. The mag fluoride is this index typically and the air is this. So the amount of reflection for R1 is gonna be different because of these numbers than the amount of reflection from R2 which is based on these numbers. So they're no longer equal amounts of reflection, R1 and R2. So here's the, the R1, and here's the R2, which is much smaller. So if I look at my vector diagram here, or the circle diagram, the R1 brings me from zero reflection out to this point, and the R2 brings it up to here. So the reflection is about this amount, which is the same as a reflection of a bare glass surface without any coating on it. So in that case, the R1, if it's uncoated, would come all the way out here. Now, if I watch this uh, as the thickness of the coating gets thicker from zero thickness to its maximum, the quarter wave brings me down as close to zero as I can get. But uh, not all the way to zero because the reflection from R1 and R2 is not of the same magnitude. And then if I go to a half wave as seen here, 
uh, I'm back to where I started. So that's why we call the half wave coding at one wavelength, it is an absentee layer. It's as though it's not there at all. So I'm gonna be talking about these circle diagrams or reflectance amplitude diagrams uh, throughout the rest of this presentation. So I hope you are reasonably comfortable with that. Now, the reflection that I get with this magnesium fluoride on glass is about one and a quarter percent. And the maximum reflection is back to that of an uncoated substrate. Now, here's a somewhat representation of that same thing, where again, this is zero reflectance over here and our maximum uncoated reflectance here. But now I want to talk about how things change with color. So uh, if this is just a quarter wave, quarter wave thick at green light, then I'm going to have my minimum reflection for green light. But red light, this will not have been a quarter wave thick. It's a longer wavelength, so it doesn't get as far in red light. And so I'll have a higher reflection at that point. Blue light, on the other hand, is a shorter wavelength than green. So this physical thickness that got the green to here will actually get the blue beyond a quarter wave. And again, I have increased reflection at that point. So when I look at that, I'll see that the uncoated substrate is blue here, and the coated substrate is red. And the minimum, if I've made it a quarter wave at, we'll say, uh, 580 or 5, I'm sorry, 560, uh, we'll say, or 50, then that's the minimum. And I have more reflection in the red and more reflection than blue. So that's typical of a single layer and a reflection coating. Now, in order to have an equal R1 and R2, there's two possibilities. <clears throat> One is that the index, as in the case of the soap bubble, is the same on both sides of the thin film. So N1 and N3 are the same. In the case of soap bubble, they're 1.0 and 1.0. Another possibility, however, is that the coating material could have an index, which is the square root of the product of the first medium and the third medium. So, uh, this is a typical thing of saying, if I get the right index for my coating material that matches the index of the air and the glass, then I would have zero reflection at the design wavelength, at the quarter wave wavelength. In the case of uh, glass, that, or if I had an index glass of index 1.9, then uh, with that high index, which uncoated would be almost 10% reflection, but with mag fluoride on it, it'll go right down to zero. Again, other wavelengths are going to reflect more red, more blue, but that's uh, what we'll say is a glass that we could actually get index coding near one index of the substrate near 1.9, but uh, mag fluoride would be a perfect AR for one wavelength. Looking at that on a circle diagram, a reflectance amplitude diagram, it would look like this, so that the reflectance goes to zero in the green. Another possibility is to have a for a substrate of index 152 to have a coating material of index 1.233. That would then satisfy that square root condition and give me a perfect AR. So here's a comparison to the bare substrate, the single air mag fluoride, and uh, a substrate of 1.9 with mag fluoride, and a substrate of 1.2 with unobtainium fluoride here. I'll move on to a little different view of the elephant here. If I were to have an optical monitor 
looking at single wavelength like in the green and I start with a bare substrate, then my reflection is about this one and a quarter percent. But as I add mag fluoride to the glass, it will decrease the reflection until I have a thickness of a quarter wave where it's a minimum. And if I add more material, it's going to go back up again to where I've got a half wave and it's got the same reflection as it had uncoated. That's that absentee layer. If I keep adding material, it'll keep going and this thing will oscillate all its way to infinity as I add thickness. Now doing that same kind of thing here, basically the same graph showing that the uncoated substrate uh, is reflecting this four and a quarter and the mag fluoride will reduce it when it's at a quarter wave to a minimum and a half wave back again to the maximum, quarter wave minimum, quarter wave maximum, so on to infinity as I get thicker and thicker. On the other hand, if I have a coating material of index 1.7, which would be a little bit in the direction of aluminum oxide, then I will increase the reflection and a quarter wave will have a maximum and a half wave a minimum and a quarter wave a max, et cetera, et cetera. And if I take something like titanium dioxide or titania, a quarter wave of that will have a high reflection and a half wave will go to zero, et cetera. So uh, also I might mention if I was coating a substrate of index 152, with a coating material of 152, then that would uh, not change anything except the thickness of the substrate. So depending on whether your index is higher or lower than the substrate, you'll get reflection which is lower or higher than the reflection of the substrate, etc. Now I have an example here of a two layer coating where I use my high index material to start from the substrate and I go a short distance down here till I intersect a circle on the circle diagram which passes through zero out of my mag fluoride material. So this might be tantalum pentoxide or TiO2 down to the magic point here where I then get on this path which will take me right to zero. So that's a way to make a perfect reflector out of two high and low index materials. Another version of that would be to start here at the substrate, add a thick layer of high index until I got back to this circle that intersects zero. So I've got a thick high, thin low, brings me again to zero reflection. Now, when I look at these at other wavelengths, well, first of all, let me mention this concept. The important concept is each new layer, as we just saw, acts as though it's starting to be applied to a bare substrate whose effective index is the resulting amplitude and phase from all the other layers that have gone before it. Let me go back and look at that for a minute. So what I'm saying is if I have this coating on the substrate, before I start with this coating, it's as though I had a substrate whose reflection was this and no other layers on it. So whether it's a stack of layers or a bare substrate that gives me this reflection, then when I add a layer, it increases it uh, to wherever it's going. To back up one more, we can see that same thing here. Uh, after the first layer, I'm here, and the second layer uh, will bring me around to some other point, and if I happen to stop at zero, so much the better. So that's what this is all about. So in the case of the soap bubble, the substrate is air. In the case of the single layer, of course, the substrate is glass. And in the case of the two layer coating, the substrate is the result of the substrate plus the layers that are coated before the layer that you're going to deposit. Here's the two different uh, AR coatings, uh, the two different choices. And here's what happens with one of the choices as a function of wavelength. 
it was designed to be a perfect AR in the green, then it of course comes to the zero point. But if that's the coating I've deposited, for red light, it won't get there. For blue light, it's already gone too far. So these are how these uh, change with wavelength. And then if I plot the various, here's an uncoated, here's the uh, single layer, and then these two V coats, V1 and V2. If I was gonna produce these, I would prefer V1 because it will have more tolerance in how far you could go before the reflection came up. So it, it's a little broader, a little more forgiving. There's a special case where if I have the right index material for the first layer, it'll bring me to the magic point where this will go from, from uh, the maximum down to zero. So this is a quarter wave of a medium index material and a quarter wave of the low index material making a perfect V coat. By the way, you can see why we call this a V coat because it comes down like a V and this is another form of the V coat. In the case of this one, here's the V coat. And this has happened to be what the color of that would look like with some red and some blue. So this becomes a magenta. If I take that case with the two layer V coat and stick a half wave of high index in here, I get an interesting result, which is what we call a three layer coating, which has a medium, high, low index, a quarter wave, a half wave, a quarter wave. And that makes a coating which behaves like this. In the case it was designed to be green and bring this right down to zero. In the red, it hasn't gone far enough with the first layer and the second layer comes around and doesn't go quite far enough. But that turns out to be a good starting point to bring this endpoint in closer to here. So when I go to the blue, this has gone too far, but the half wave goes too far, brings me now to a good starting point for the last layer, which is coming in again close to my zero reflection point. So here's an animation of that. You can see that we're staying close to zero here for a lot of the colors. Not so good here, but good there good there, starting to leave here. So up here is the wavelength of what we're seeing and simulating, and uh, that's moving along. So this is the basis of the common anti-reflection coatings that we see today, a three-layer coating. And when I look here at the comparison of these, I've got the uncoated substrate, the V-coat, and the three layer coating, which has a nice broad band. So the reflection over the visible spectrum, which this represents from 380 to 780 is a very good AR coating. So that's the basis of most of the coatings we see on eyeglasses, etc. Although there are actually four layers, which I'll show you in a minute here. So here's the four layer version of that where the first layer, which was a medium index layer, is now replaced by a thin halfway uh, high index layer and low index layer to get me over to this magic point for the half wave or what's called a necromatizing layer. And then that brings me back to uh, the zero reflection. So that four layer uh, really does the same job as a three layer and most people prefer it because it's only losing, using two materials, a high and a low, and not uh, the three materials, high, medium, low. So here's a comparison, bare substrate, single layer AR, three layer AR, four layer AR. And these are not different to the extent that you could tell them by looking at them or within the variation of production errors, you might say. Let's change the subject a little bit now to talk about this reflectance amplitude diagram or circle diagram and how I make a high reflector if I want a mirror. 
So in this case, I start here on the uncoated substrate. I put a high index layer, which increases the reflection. Because remember, the reflection is the distance from zero out to wherever I am at that particular point. So the measure of reflection is how far do I go from zero out to one here, which would be 100% reflection anywhere on this circle. So if I have a quarter wave of high, quarter wave low, quarter wave high, quarter wave low, et cetera, et cetera, I can bring myself out towards this edge here and make a high reflector. So uh, in a typical design program like uh, I use, uh, we'd have uh, that represented as a quarter wave high, quarter wave low, in parentheses repeated four times. So that describes this coating. So that's a shorthand, or you could spell it out high, low, high, low, high, low, et cetera. So if I look at that as a function of wavelength, that the design wavelength here, uh, it's a very high reflector. And uh, as I go off wavelength, I start to lose that. In fact, I'll get out to where it's actually passing the light instead of reflecting it. And on the long wavelength side, we'll call that a long wave pass filter. On the short wave side, we call it a short wave pass. How do you like that for logic? Uh, I can also, by uh, advanced design, get rid of these weeds on this side and knock it down low, or get rid of the weeds on this side, or in some cases even get rid of them on both sides, more or less. Now, I'll show you a different scale here. The uh, reflectance scale is still the same, but this scale down here is different. Excuse me. So this scale here now is in wave numbers rather than wave length. So this is the number of waves per centimeter. So this, in fact, would represent 10 microns. And this would remember, represent 5 microns. And this would be 20 microns. Now, also, another nomenclature, which we'll occasionally see, is the G nomenclature, where this is the design wavelength. G equals one, and out here would be twice the design wavelength, G equals two, or half the design wavelength. So we may use these different nomenclatures. This happens to be like what we saw before with an index like tantalum pentoxide, or titanium dioxide, I'm sorry, and mag fluoride. So one layer, one H, would give me this reflection uh, add a layer pair of 1H, 1L plus that same H, I move up to here, and every layer pair will increase this reflection higher and higher. Now, all dielectric coatings, coatings that have no absorbing material, can produce a great variety of designs and are the basis for anti-reflection coatings, high reflection coatings, in between coatings are neutral beam splitters, the short wave pass, the long wave pass, or I could put one of these with one of those to make a wide band pass. The narrow band pass we'll talk about in a minute, and that's uh, a special case. Then we can have minus filters and polarizing beam splitters, which I'll uh, talk about uh, perhaps a little bit. So in the first chapter of my seven chapter book that has all this in it and that we use in the SVC one day course on this subject, I talk about other things such as why are bubbles uh, and oil films colored, uh, back of the envelope calculations that we can make without even using a computer, medium broadband reflectors and beam splitters, cleaning up the filters, getting rid of that uh, the weeds that I showed you, and crystal coatings, which is the ultimate coating, which you're now able to do uh, for things like uh, the uh, intergalactic interferometers, etc. Okay, now let's talk about materials that are absorbing, such as an aluminum mirror. If I deposit an aluminum mirror, I'll get a coating that looks like this red line. That reflects about 90% or more, depending on the wavelength. 
Now, aluminum is somewhat vulnerable. We can scratch it if we uh, rub it with anything much more than cotton swab. Uh, and I could protect it by putting a layer on top of it of almost any material, uh, if it's not absorbing, will, if it's a half wave thick, will cause it to have no change at the design wavelength here. But at other wavelengths, of course, it's gonna change with wavelength. So this would be a protected aluminum coating with maybe silicon monoxide, silicon dioxide, uh, or whatever. Uh, depends on the wavelength region you're interested in. So that was uh, one of the first two-layer coatings that probably happened in maybe the 1930s, 40s time frame to protect an aluminum coating. I can enhance the aluminum coating by taking the uh, the bare aluminum and depositing a two-layer coating of high-low index, just like on the all dielectric mirrors we looked at, this will enhance the reflection. And uh, you can go on with more and more layers to increase the reflection at, uh, at design wavelength, although it will decrease the reflection at other wavelengths. Now, this is an all dielectric mirror with different numbers of layers. Uh, higher and higher numbers of layers will make this steeper and higher across this band here. The band width here depends on the difference in index from uh, between the high and low. The bigger the difference of index, the broader this is. If you have a small difference in index, you'll create a narrow band which is what we call the minus filter. I see that I'm running short on time here. Uh, let me take a quick look at uh, what maybe we'll skip, skip through to. Uh, let me talk about the, uh, the principle of the uh, the narrow bandpass filter. So I showed you a curve that looked like this earlier, where with an index of 235, I increased the reflection here. If I had a germanium coating, the quarter wave would be even higher reflection, but a half wave would go to zero. Now, since we're just dealing with numbers here, any number will do. So we'll go to imaginary materials like an index of 32. And it'll show the principle that the reflection at a quarter wave becomes very high. It's a good mirror. But at a half wave point, it again transmits as though there was no coating there, the half wave. So this is the principle of the narrow bandpass filter, where uh, I've got a high, a high reflector on one side and a high reflector on the other and a half wave dielectric spacer here, which does not absorb anything. And if I put a metal on here like silver, I could have the first narrow bandpass filters that were made, but uh, by the 50s, Polster, who I had the good fortune of working with as a summer intern student, uh, said, well, let's make the mirrors out of dielectrics, so there's no absorption. So we have a dielectric quarter wave stack on this side and this side, and now I've got a, uh, a narrow bandpass filter which will transmit well in the visible. Now if I look at depositing one of these, uh, I'll have, uh, start with my bare substrate, and this is an optical monitor, at the wavelength that the filter is going to work. So, whoops. Um, we start at the bare substrate, a quarter wave of high, quarter wave low, quarter wave high, quarter low, quarter, quarter. And now I don't stop at the quarter wave here. I go to the half wave. So now that's my spacer or my cavity layer. And then the dielectric stack is over here again. So that will make this uh, filter that we uh, want. 
Now, let me make sure we're all on the same nomenclature here. I talk about optical density and decibels. Transmission of 100% is an optical density of two and a transmission of 10% is the density one, 1% 1 is the density two, etc. The electronic people with the communications world that we're now in wants us to also talk in their nomenclature where uh, decibels is 10 times this. So when I talk in decibels, remember I'm talking 10 times the optical density. So here's a curve where I'm talking in decibels here. So this is one decibel or an optical density of 0.1. So this is very high transmittance actually, but that will be the bandpass of a filter that has this design as I pointed out to you previously. And if I look at it on this scale, here's up to uh, optical density of four, for example, four and a half, showing that this filter has a very narrow bandpass and a big blocking range here and a blocking range here. Now, if I have two cavities, that is I put two of these filters, one after the other, and I get the phase between them correct, uh, I'll have a design uh, that looks like this, uh, where this basic cavity is repeated three times and I get a much steeper sidebands, a flatter top, etc. So these are narrowband filters. Let me touch a bit on polarization. Uh, we have here the uh, incoming light, whoops, the incoming light is polarized with uh, S and P polarization, where the P polarization is plunging into our surface here. Uh, we'll say this is the substrate and that's air. And the S polarization is sliding uh, in and out along the surface. So the S polarization is in and out of the view here. Uh, if I happen to be at the magic Brewster angle, um, then the P polarization will not reflect at all, only the S, and this will come down. Some of the S also is transmitted, but the P is not. So there's a whole study of all that. But the Brewster angle is this magic angle that does not reflect any P light. If I look at a graph of that, we'd see that at normal incidence, we got the 4% or so, but for the P polarization, we come down to zero reflection at the Brewster angle. The S polarization just increases. If we had germanium, the Brewster angle would be out here in the 70, 77 degree range, etc. Now the S polarization and the P polarization are calculated differently in the sense that we have the normal incidence, but for S polarization, as the cosine of the angle of incidence. For the P polarization, the cosine is below the uh, normal incidence. So I'd had a hard time remembering which one is which of the S and P. And my way of now remembering it is to think of this as a submarine, where the, when the submarine's on the surface S, I get the cosine uh, on the level with the N and when the sub submarine is submerged, it's below the surface, I get the P polarization with the periscope being up. Now, if you look at the mathematics of all this with angles and uh, indices, which have both N and K, et cetera, it gets quite complex. Fortunately, with computers nowadays, uh, we let the computer do all the heavy lifting. But back, uh, in the 40s and 50s, before we had computers, uh, it was a much harder job than it is today. Now, here's something important on a different subject that I want to deal with here. And I'm going to plan to run 
the full hour and a half, if you don't mind. Obviously, anybody can leave at any time you want to, but I'm going to set my early warning here. Ron, let me suggest you take as much time as you need, sir. Well, okay. What time is breakfast? Uh, we want to make sure that we leave a little bit of time to answer a few questions. Okay. Folks might have, so just please continue on. Okay, thank you. You're a gentleman and a scholar. Okay, this is an important concept that uh, I wrestled with for a long time until I got to my current conclusion. Let's say I have a substrate of germanium of index four in a medium of air index one. Then we know from that square root formula that the ideal quarter wave would be an index two and would be a quarter wave thick. In this case, I want to coating it to coat, make a good AR at 10 microns. So that's what we get, a step down, you might say, from the high index to the low index. Now, if I were to take two layers, I can figure out what the index of the two layers needs to be to do the best I can do. And with, if you work it out, uh, comes out with these numbers. So now that, that's a step down with two steps. If I go to three steps, I can work that out, one, two, three, et cetera. If I plot these uh, the, on the wave number scale from a very low frequency or long wavelength to a high frequency or high wavelength, the one step is a V coat on this scale. It comes down to zero, but it goes back up quickly. The two step is broader and the three step is broader still. So if I continue that line of thinking, I can go in this case to a seven step where the old one step is in here is the dotted line and the seven step is the solid line and all the ones in between. So we now see this coming down more smoothly. And if we plot that, we'll see we got one, two, three, four up to the seven layer. So we get broader and broader as we break that into more and more small steps. In the extreme case, I'm basically approaching a curve which has this shape here. And that will, in principle, have an infinite broad band. And uh, so that's the underlying principle of an AR coating. Now in this first chapter, uh, let's give you a quick list of all the many other things that we talk about uh, when we have time. Uh, broadband mirrors, half wave holes, estimating the number of layers you need to achieve a certain AR coating uh, to minimize the reflection. <clears throat> the design of multi-cavity narrowband fast filters controlling and estimating the bandwidth of broad and narrow bandpass filters. Brewster angle, uh, coating shifts, polarization, ellipsometry, and other ways of viewing. Herpin and X, Epstein and other approximations. Uh, moth eye coatings, which are now practical. Inhomogeneous designs. And the effects of films that are too thick, even from a design point of view. You can, films can be too thin or too thick and have uh, some adverse effects. Okay, let me go on to what is uh, my third chapter. We'll talk now about uh, materials that have absorption. So now we're no longer going to ignore the uh, term here. Whoops. Let's get back to Dixie here. So we've got absorption that's coming into play here. So the absorption is a constant four pi times the K value, which we see up here, divided by wavelength. And if I <coughs> have an incident energy on an absorbing film of intensity I zero. 
it multiplied times e to the minus alpha x, where x is the thickness of the layer. That'll give me the intensity that comes through here. So we're talking about films that have absorption. At Joe Apfel, the chief technologist at uh, Optical Coding Labs back uh, some decades ago, came up with the triangle diagram, which I think is a very useful tool when you start to work with absorbing materials. So on Apple's triangle diagram, uh, we've been working along this edge where there's no absorption. And this point over here would be 100% absorption. So the scale in this direction is from zero absorption to 100%. Now, if we had something like an aluminum film where we put down enough film to go from the bare substrate down to here, now I've got some absorption, some transmission, and some reflection. On this vertical scale, I'm measuring transmittance. So if I get down to the bottom here, I've got zero transmittance. And... Uh, so this has some transmittance, which in this case is somewhere between one and 20, or zero and 20%. Let's say maybe that's 14% transmission. Maybe it's uh, uh, 14% absorbing, et cetera. Uh, here was from Apple's paper, the different uh, things for silver, which has very little absorption, uh, gold, copper, magnesium, etc., titanium. Uh, here's chromium. So if I start with a bare glass substrate, looking at 550 nanometers, one nanometer of chromium will bring me down to here. And I get way down here, it becomes opaque, zero transmission. If I look at this on a, let's say I put a film down with three layers uh, on a circle diagram using chromium and uh, maybe SiO2. So my chromium goes from the bare substrate up to here. So I've still got some transmission. Then I switch over to SiO2, for example, get me around to here. And then I switch back to the uh, chromium that'll bring me to zero. So I've got zero reflection at this wavelength for this three layer coating. And uh, if I plot that, I see here's the zero reflection. But again, at other wavelengths, I get red reflection and blue. So this would be a coating that was purple or magenta, but it is zero reflection at the design wavelength. Now it also has some transmission so at the design wavelength, it's got about 20% transmission. And the transmission through it then is going to be uh, fairly constant here, but it's going to transmit more, uh, more blue. So this will look blue looking through it because there's more blue than red. Here's what this looks like on a triangle diagram. I start with the bare substrate. I come down to the end of the first chrome layer, my uh, SiO2 layer brings me out here and the chrome layer brings me down to this point, which has no reflection at that design wavelength. Also notice that dielectrics on the triangle diagram radiate from this point as the radiation point and they go outward from there. So if I stop the chrome layer up here, for example, then the, SiO2 layer would go this way. Also, we can look at opaque films, like the chrome opaque film on the circle diagram uh, would reflect, let's say at 409, would reflect out to here. So it has a certain reflection. At 7 tenths, it's not quite as far out from zero so the red would actually look a little less. That says that a chrome, opaque chrome film would have a bluish cast. 
but if you happen to be looking at the outdoors, the blue you might see is a reflection of the sky. Uh, here's aluminum, which is uh, happens to be the best material over the visible spectrum out into the ultraviolet at uh, 1400 nanometers. So that's a fairly white coating in the visible and all the way out into the ultraviolet. Uh, silver, an opaque silver has a strange behavior in that in the visible, it's a pretty high reflector, but it does drop slightly toward the uh, ultraviolet. And then when you get into the ultraviolet, it goes down very low. And astronomers discovered many years ago that a appropriate silver film could be used as an ultraviolet film while taking pictures through an uh, astronomical telescope. Uh, we'll just quickly talk about, you can make combinations of metals and dielectrics. <coughs> Excuse me. That um, will give you a uh, filter that, let's say, has this, oops, this narrowband transmission. But uh, it was found that that was inappropriate to its application where although the the uh, reflectance or the transmission was good it had all this high reflection which was undesirable so they had to redesign it with additional layers so they got knocked down that reflection to this level here which was workable for their application. And it did decrease the transmission from here to here, but at least the filter was still workable with somewhat less transmission. Here's a, uh, a narrow bandpass all reflection filter. This does not transmit anything, but it would have a very gr bright green reflectance. Now, here we talk about electric field, which is important if there's any absorption in a film. And here's the dielectrics of this particular green filter, reflection filter. This is the dielectric stacks reflection through here. And then here is a very thin metallic film, which has some transparency. At this wavelength, the design wavelength, we'll say, the electric field has been designed by the design of the dielectric layers to have very low electric field when it gets to the, the dielectric layer. And so the absorption there is quite small. On the other hand, at this wavelength, which is in the blocking band, the dielectrics bring it to where the electric field is this coming up to the, or to the metal and in the film, the electric field is way up here as opposed to when it was way down here. So this absorbs like crazy out here. And that's what gives us the absorption we see here and the transmission here. Well, viewing that on just a simple triangle diagram, it would just look like this line here. So I added the dimension of the thickness here to what I call a prism diagram. And uh, uh, so now we can see what's happening with the dielectrics. So this is at the design wavelength where the reflectance is still high. Remember reflectance is zero here and 100% here. But left wavelength, all of a sudden, whoops. <laughs> if I shift wavelength, all of a sudden, this goes way over to here. So you see that swishing left to right, right to left, as I change wavelength. So the prism diagram, although I haven't seen anybody use it but me, I find in cases like this, it helps visualize what's happening. Okay, other things in uh, chapter three, we deal with potential transmittance, uh, the triangle diagrams of various metals, materials, circle diagrams uh, of various 
that your black mirror design has become important nowadays. AR coatings for neutral density filters. Again, here's this. Now let's talk about harmonics. We've been looking at uh, quarter wave stacks where we've only been looking over this sort of band here. But if I uh, use the optical density scale and the wave per scale, uh, if my design wavelength happens to be, uh, let's say one wave number here, or you could multiply this by a thousand or whatever number you want. But I like the uh, wave number wave number scale because of the symmetry of things we see here. So here's what we've been looking at. But if I look where these are quarter waves, if I go out to three quarter waves, all of a sudden I've got the same behavior as here or five quarter waves, same as here, because three quarter waves is just one quarter wave plus a half wave. And we know that half waves are, act as though they're not there. So this would be one quarter wave plus two half waves or one quarter wave plus three half, et cetera. So my nomenclature here, I'll talk about this is an important nomenclature. I'll call this a two to one design because the second harmonic is not here and the fourth and the sixth, et cetera. So I'll show you more about that. The, uh, here's the normal design with the uh, quarter wave half, quarter wave, quarter wave high, quarter wave low for the half wave. So the thickness of the thinnest layer and the ratio of that to the overall is two to one. A thinner high layer will give me three to one, thinner still four to one. So if I look at a three to one stack instead of a two to one stack, I find that the third harmonic is not there, but I have the first and second and the sixth and the ninth, et cetera. This helps visualize something we call the half wave hole. If I'm not exactly two to one, that second harmonic, which shouldn't be there, starts to sneak in and creates that half wave hole. So that's a view of another view of the elephant. Uh, here's a four to one stack. So if I were trying to make a filter to block a YAG wavelength, its second and third harmonic, a four to one filter would do the trick. And the intensity or the optical density for blocking that uh, would be shown here by what we call the osculating curve, which I talk about in the long version of the course. Now, looking at these kinds of things, again, on an optical density scale, the, whoops, the thickness here is the same on a wave number scale as it is here. But if I divide that thickness by the wave number, this one is nine times narrower than this one. So I can take advantage of that if I want a narrow filter. For example, if I use the seventh order to block something at 550 wavelength, I'll get a narrow blocking band, so I'll transmit most of the light here and here. And that's um, uh, useful. This probably won't bother me, but I might be bothered by the fact that this is knocking out some significant blue light. If I want to get rid of that, uh, there's a possibility of saying, okay, let's look at a 10 to one stack. So now here's my old original quarter wave stack, whereas this is a nine to one stack or a 10 to one stack, 10 is missing. But this, this turns out is quite narrow as compared to this one here. I could use that to advantage to design a filter which has only this blocking band. Now, it happens to have 240 layers, but what's that amongst friends, right? 
So nowadays we could do this if we really wanted to. I'm more interested at this point to talk about design principles. That's what we're talking about. So we could get these films which have very narrow high index layers and very broad low index layers. This is what I call a fence post design because these look like fence posts on a pasture that's low index. Uh, the converse is true. We can have post hole designs, etc. cetera. Um, let me go through just one more thing. I've got so much more material I'd like to share. We don't wanna go for too many hours here. So this was a paper talking about these narrow, uh, thin layers. The short wave pass filter is limited in the case of the usual quarter wave stack designs. When the band passes are broader than about two, we need a short wave for the need of short wave filter. We want to go to rugate like designs. Well, let me define what I'm using as bandwidth here. It's the longest wavelength into band divided by the shortest. So in this case, uh, on a wavelength scale, Here's the longest wavelength in the band and the shortest. So this would be, we'll stay from 1600 to 1400 or a bandwidth of four. That's my definition. So again, on the wave number scale, here's a short wave pass and a long wave pass. What I'm saying is this short wave pass is limited to this band here because that third harmonic will come in and get in our way. So we gotta get rid of that third harmonic to go broader. So that's what this uh, discussion is all about in the, the original paper that I was talking about. So we're limited uh, if we're using only quarter waves to uh, something that looks like this. So it, it basically falls apart when we get to bandwidths much over two. So this is our normal quarter wave stack if we plot the refractive index versus thickness, high, low, high, low. And these are the actual bands I get. So this is the first harmonic, third, fifth, seventh, no second, fourth, etc. Now, if I take the edge of this and split out uh, a little bit of the edge and make two layers here. The combination of those two layers acts like a layer that's maybe this index instead of either that or that. So that's the herpin equivalent that uh, some of you may be familiar with. So if I split that off in the right proportions on each side of these, I'm now making it as though the index is gradually going down not exactly smoothly, but in the direction of smoothly. And if I do that just right, I get rid of that third harmonic. So now I can make the filter or the AR coding that wide. If I do the same thing with more layers, I get that and more layers, I get that. So I can go way on up by doing this. And these basically, start to approximate a fairly sinusoidal index profile on the average. And that's what a Rugate filter is, where the real index is varying gradually. Here, I can do the same as a Rugate by using just high and low indices and the right thicknesses, as long as I can do thin layers. Uh, this is kind of a summary of the number of layers it takes, etc. So, rugate like designs are needed. Uh, two materials can be used as a surrugate instead of a rugate, etc. Okay. Um, well, uh, I'll go ahead and ramble on here. Thank you, Frank.
Okay, it's important to have the reflectance and transmittance of the films that we know exactly what we've got in order to prove this to our customer. We also need to know it so we can develop our process. If we don't know Okay, if there are errors in our knowledge of reflection and transmission, there'll be errors in the knowledge of the N and K of the materials and lead to design process errors. So uh, one thing is to make sure we're well calibrated in our spectrophotometers or uh, ellipsometers, if that's what you're using, but most of us use spectrophotometers. Uh, so we need to trace a 100% line and a zero line so we know where those are. They're not usually exactly 100% or zero, particularly the 100%. The zeros might be better. And then we run our sample, get its trace, and then I can use this simple formula to calculate or calibrate what the true transmission is. Now, if I'm doing reflection samples, I need some attachment such as this and do the same kind of things. And here's an attachment that I built for my own use, which I think is actually a better approach from an instrument design than what I've seen on the marketplace, where we actually, if I go back to this, by the geometry of this from an optical design point of view, this should be an ellipsoid, which uh, focuses an image which would have formed here onto the sample up here. So that's a, an elliptical with two foci. And then this would be a symmetrical one so that the beam, the spectrophotometer thought focused here will come back into the spectrophotometer being like it came from that point. This This does that um, in a better way in that this is a flat mirror, that's a flat mirror, that's a flat mirror, that's a flat mirror, and these are spherical mirrors approximating an ellipsoid that would focus this point onto that point. So this is the simplest, cheapest kind of thing you can do. I've made a few of them that work fine. I digress. So I go through discussions of the various measuring instruments, et cetera, which I won't belabor here. And these uh, things like the um, uh, ocean optics are very nice. I've had a bunch of these and got them for my customers and been very happy with them. So I go into long discussions about all that stuff and calibration. Uh, in recent years, we've now had instruments like the uh, Cary uh, UMS, which the beam falls on the sample and the reflected beam is picked up by this detector, or this can swing around here and measure the transmission. And the experience I've seen with working my customers who have this, this seems to uh, work pretty well. They're fairly complicated from a software point of view, but uh, Fred Goldstein, who was listening here today, uh, has overcome that problem for some of his customers. Uh, another application of this geometry is available uh, by Photon RT, and uh, I've seen very satisfactory results from them. Okay, other things come. Uh, in chapter five, uh, let's talk briefly about uh, index of refraction and determining what it is so you can design properly with it. So atoms are like a bowling ball on a spring. And if I uh, hold on, grab onto this here and move it up and down, then the bowling ball will move up and down. And uh, if I move it, move it up and down slowly, the bowling ball will follow it accurately. But if I move this rapidly up and down, the bowling ball is hardly going to wiggle. 
And this is what happens with atoms in our uh, materials, substrates, coatings, etc. cetera. Uh, here's actual data from uh, Palix tables on the resonance or the N and K dispersion of silicon monoxide. So the K value has a lot of absorption right around nine or 10 microns, but is a good transparent material out uh, to maybe seven or more microns. But this resonance we see here is like that bowling ball in that here's typical behavior. If the bowling ball were in a barrel of oil and I move it, it's gonna not respond very much at resonance because of the damping. But if there's, if it's just in the air and I'm at the right frequency, the bowling ball will oscillate strongly. So that's this resonance we see here, but in a barrel of oil, it would be damped out and, and not much. On the other hand, the phase of the bowling ball, if uh, it's in air, will track very closely, uh, except at revenant resonance where it changes phase 180 degrees. But if there's a lot of damping, it'll do this. So uh, we go in a lot more detail about that, but to mash on here, if I were to deposit uh, a, a four quarter waves of TiO2, the optical monitor signal would look like this, the bare substrate, a quarter wave, half wave, three quarters. I deposit that film, then I look at its spectrum, it'll look like this. So I can measure points on the spectrum and modern spectrophotometers automatically will give you that data that you can import into your program. And we can try to figure out what the index of refraction is from this curve. Now, the simplest approximation of that curve would be to say, okay, I have index of refraction, which was the same at all wavelengths. So it has no dispersion. But if I uh, wanna add some dispersion effect, I can use this simple formula. So here's a constant factor plus this, which is a function of wavelength. And I can get a fit, which in Filmstar is called a dollar quad fit, or uh, I can have another version called a quad K, which will fit a similar formula for the K value. And when I do something like that, I'll get an optimization that fits it pretty well may be good enough for simple work. But if I look at the transmittance curve, I find that when I do that, I've got a fair discrepancy here. And that tells me from the transmittance curve that I've got absorption in my film. I would not see it so clearly in the reflection curve because these are the same reflection and you don't don't see that effect so well. But that tells me there's absorption. So I need a better fit if that's important to me. And so by using the dollar quad, I can get a better fit. Still some discrepancy, but I'm now taking into account the absorption. Uh, I go through a bunch of examples here. This is a, an extended version of what had just these two terms. This third term, Cauchy is attributed to this. And there I get a better fit in reflectance, transmittance, etc. cetera. Um, now we've extended Cauchy and uh, Tikhon Ravoff and his associates have applied this formula, which is a better fit to nature. So these are the equations which are among the more sophisticated and this is Alexander Tikhonrovov and his other associates that you may know. So with this extended fit, we get quite a bit better results. And uh, here's the transmit fit. So that's good enough for government work, as we say. In fact, it's good enough for probably anybody's work.
Uh, so here's a good good fit. You can see the uh, bare substrate and the coated substrate. So now we have determined to satisfactory accuracy the index of refraction of the high index material, in this case, TiO2. Uh, now, what Mr. Willie, yes. Excuse me. We we do need to wrap up, sir. Okay. Okay. Uh, I will do that. So, lots of more I'd like to tell you, but uh, we will uh, call it quits for there. Uh, we certainly uh, will be happy to talk to these things in the course or courses. Uh, so let me jump in here, Ron, for a second. So uh, if you go to your question and answer box, uh, you'll see the best advertisement for everyone attending to either engage Ron as a consultant or take Ron's uh, or one of Ron's uh, tutorials uh, at the TechCon. Uh, what you have just seen is an overview of what typically takes a minimum of eight hours to do in a typical session. And uh, Ron, on, on behalf of uh, everyone in attendance and the SVC, I wanna thank you for uh, sharing your, your perspective with us. We have a number of questions. Um, and I'm going to allow Dr. Kumar to speak. Uh, and I'm going to suggest that uh, we have time for possibly one or two questions afterwards. So, Dr. Kumar, you are, you, your microphone should be enabled. If you were to unmute yourself. There we go. So, Good morning, uh, sir. Good morning, sir. Good morning. I'm very much glad to listen to the speaker from you, sir. Uh, as of my PhD was uh, completed by your uh, book only. Well, I'm glad you got your degree. As well as uh, right now I'm working on uh, window applications. For that, uh, the float glass will be used as a substrate. Okay. So in that, uh, I am understanding that uh, it doesn't have 4% reflection per surface. It is having 8% reflection. How you do this kind of calculation for calculating the reflection and transmission? Okay, each, each surface reflects uh, 4% or a little more. So for two surfaces, you'd have 8% or a little more. No, it's per surface for normal optical glass, it is 4%. But yes. in the float glass, it is giving 8% reflection per surface. So both surface, it is giving 8 plus 8, 16%. How you do this calculation in the, in the terms of transmission measurement and reflection measurement while we are going per, to perform number of optical, optical coatings on the float glass? Okay, why is it reflecting 8% per surface? Yes. Why? As well as I am thinking that during the transmission measurement from the UV visible spectroscopy, it is giving 8% reflection of the float glass uh, component. Of, uh, I have seen that one, that kind of substrate I, have, I am having. Okay. Uh, how about uh, you and I have an email conversation uh, because there must be something going on. It can't, it can't be uh, normal float glass if it's reflecting 8% per surface. There's got to be something else going on. Okay. So let's let's talk over email for that in the future. Okay, sir. I will uh, I will uh, send you the transmission data of the float glass. What what we are seeing it. Okay. And uh, on that, we are doing a double uh, glazing coating of silver coating, like for glazing of uh, glazing purpose. Okay. So in that, we are facing the adhesion property, adhesion uh, removal property of, of the silver. It is going to oxidize. How to, uh, how to overcome this one? If I understand you, you're concerned with adhesion? Yes. Yeah, well, that, 
that's kind of the subject of my production course, which we'll do like this uh, later this month. But uh, yeah, adhesion is material in process problems. And we could talk a little about that in email. Back to your uh, your first question about the uh, index of the substrate. If we can properly characterize the substrate, whether it's 4% or 8%, or we can still include that in the design process. So by email, we'll talk uh, about characterizing your substrate, whatever its index, and then using that in the design process. And with respect to adhesion, of course, that's a whole nother subject, but I'd be happy to talk to you about it uh, in an email. Okay, sir. Another small question is there. Can you explain about the dehydration? Dr. Kumar, I'm sorry. Dr. Kumar, apologies, but we have time for one more question and we want to let Mr. Pierce uh, ask a question. So, Ben, would you please? Uh, okay, your, okay your sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Hi, Ron. So for architectural glass industry, it looks like, you know, the coatings that you were discussing, they were very specific. You're letting in one particular wavelength, like nanometer kind of resolution here. But if you want something that's a wide band filter where you're letting in as much visible light as possible for aesthetics, but you're blocking out UV and IR, it looked like based on the examples you were showing, you'd want to increase the number of alternating layers of high and low dial, oh, sorry, high and low index of refraction materials. Do I have that right? Uh, it sounds like it basically to increase reflection with dielectric only, uh, you've got to increase the number of layers, increase the number of interfaces that are reflecting. All right, thank you. So, so let me just uh, wrap this up for everyone. You will all receive um, a follow-up email and Later on over this weekend, we will be posting this video up on the SBC's YouTube channel. So again, uh, Ron, thank you very much for uh, spending your time to share with us uh, your expertise. And let me thank our attendees for taking the time out of your day to uh, sit and join with us, uh, have a cup of coffee. Well, it was a 90 minute cup of coffee, but it was still a good cup of coffee. So thank you all. Thank you.